with my own guitar. I think I'd like to hear um, more of my voice in this guitar. That should be okay now. Okay. This will be Slate. Take one. Beautiful people. kind of echo chamber in me or something. Just... Yeah, the reason is we're recording you in echo chamber because we can't do it afterwards. Well, can you put less? I feel I'm reverberating all over the place. You'll sound different with the track anyway. Yeah, okay. Here comes the track. Good. Beautiful people. To another edition of In Words and Music, and I am so happy today to welcome our guest, the one and only Melanie Safka. Melanie, great to see you. Hi, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're here too. Uh, I've got to start with the with the obvious question: um, How are you doing? How are you coping during lockdown? Um, have you discovered oh, yeah. anything about yourself? You no, know, I I have sort of. Um, I'm an imaginative person. <laughs> I'm not really, a, I'm not 
going into total agreement with the entire way it's been done. Um, I mean, that's just me, you know, I'm not very politically correct and I'm not, I don't wear a face mask because I have just too much information that they don't work. And a lot of people wouldn't like me. And a lot of people politicize this thing, you know, which I think is very dangerous. Because when people believe there's a right side and a wrong side, it's so easy to control them, you know? So I'm, I'm a, a little bit out there, you know, as far as my point of view. So you might not want to even talk to me about this. <laughs> no, I, I'm more than happy to talk to you about, about any number of things. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, it's uh, one's point of view. And I think nobody has a clue at the moment quite <laughs> what on earth is going on. Um, let's, let's move on for now. and let, Let's go right back into the past. Can I ask you... Um, what was your very earliest musical memory? Um, when I was about three or four years old, um, I came from a very musical house. The, my entire family sang and played instruments. My mom was a jazz blues singer, and my uncle George was a union protest song singer, labor songs. And uh, my grandmother was uh, uh, in the ladies garment workers union and she, uh, you know, fought for the women's rights there. And in those sweat factories, you know, in the sewing machine, and she, she did what she called peace work. And it wasn't that kind of peace. It was each little sleeve, you know, you got, a few pennies and 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 she was really active in women's you know the rights of the ladies garment workers union and she she was from italy and she um uh sang you know the italians every one of them that i knew growing up they just would break into song you know, they'd be walking down the street, oh, 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 oh. And, and my grandmother sang. My uncle George taught me how to play the ukulele. It was a baritone ukulele. And um, that's what I learned to play first. Was do, you recall, do you recall the first song you played? Yes. <laughs> it was... Um, uh, High over the grasses, the butterfly passes and whispers sweet clover arise. For winter is over and I am your lover, sweet clover, do open your eyes. And it acquired two chords. You know, I called it the number one chord and the number two chord. Number one was just pressing down on that, on the third fret, the first string. And the number two chord was those two fingers on, on um, you know, the top and skip a string down. Right. Anyway, those are the first two chords I learned. And um, that was the first song I learned. And looking back on that childhood, how would you describe it? How would you describe your childhood now? I was, I was left on my own. I, I think that was the most wonderful thing about my childhood is that people didn't seem to interfere. You know, um, I had grown-ups all around me, but, and I knew I was taken care of. But I would, on a weekend... They would open the door and I'd go out and I wouldn't come back till it was dinner time, you know, <laughs> and, um, and that's how I think about those, that freedom, that absolute freedom to wander, look at things, talk to people, although they always warned, don't talk to strangers. <laughs> so everybody was a stranger. <laughs> um, it was New York, you know, uh, but, um, 
nobody meddled with me. You know what I mean? Nobody said, well, how does Melanie feel about that? <laughs> you know, not, none of that. There was none of that. It was, um, I mean, I once remember coming up from uh, the basement the level of, uh, under our apartment was uh, a set of stairs that went down and the super, that's the superintendent, mm -hmm. would, uh, he, was, he would make wine. He was from Italy as well. And he made wine. There was always this very pungent smell coming past this certain part of the basement level of the uh, apartment building. And then there was a little back area where <clears throat> I found a fig tree. He grew a fig tree in New York. Wow. And in the winter, uh, you know, when it started getting cold, he wrapped. And then in the, when it started to get warm, he would unwrap it and figs that I didn't even, I didn't know what they were, you know, would grow. And he said I could pick them if I wanted. And cause there were thousands of them that would grow on this tree. And I was, I, uh, I was fascinated with the whole idea of anything growing that you could eat. You know, I, I, I mean, to me, an, an orange you found in the grocery store, you know, it wasn't something that grew. Um, that was my child reality, you know, on it. And so when he said I could pick these, and it was before they were ripe, and if you pick a fig, this white milky stuff comes out, it's sticky, very, very sticky. And I was, uh, you know, I, one day I had been there and I was playing with this white gooey stuff, and these boys came and they interrupted my solitude and they they said oh what is she doing and they started taunting me you know and, and um one kid said oh she's got gook mother gook she's mother gook and you know it's funny how uh, something like that sticks with you and i ran i started to cry really upset being called mother gook and i ran upstairs and this is a memory I have of being taught uh, to make, to have me feel better. Um, it was a good kind of meddling because I ran upstairs sobbing and crying. And um, my uncle George said, what's the matter? And I they're calling me Mother Gook. They call me Mother Gook. And um, he said, just remember, next time that happens, you look at them and say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names may, will never harm me. And when I die, I'll spit in your eye and then I'll join the army. <laughs> That's, that was my great defense. I was armed with that. And the next time I went down, no boys came. <laughs> but I was ready. What is wrong with boys? That's a question I've asked myself all my life. I what is know. wrong with us boys? Boys, boys, boys. Well, so, I, they always seem to hang around in packs. <laughs> right. So, so a life of freedom, did school encroach upon that freedom of yours? Yeah. I, I loved school until a certain point. And um, I'm trying to, it, it was, uh, I was, really had an aptitude for math clearly presented to my parents, but they insisted I wasn't trying hard enough, but I, I truly, I was lost. Mm. I was lost in math. There was some key, maybe there was a misunderstood word. Maybe it was, you know, one little concept I wasn't getting, but they said I had very, great ability in math, but I wasn't trying hard enough. And so I kept failing math and they kept putting it up to my non wanting, you know, just not doing it, but it's not, it wasn't true. And, um, that, that became, uh, so there I was saddled with, I don't do math. <laughs> you know. And, and for the, my whole life, I've, I've, 
as soon as numbers enter and I'm fascinated with numbers, but as soon as it's mathematical, I'm, um, I'm not interested. Well, I'm with you on that. I always say, I always make the excuse that I must have been away the day they did maths at school. Uh, <laughs> My cuckoo. Well said, cuckoo, well said. <laughs> Were your talents recognized at school? Um, early on, I, my mom would be encouraging. She would, uh, I, I would be in talent contests and whatever they were. They were contests and, and people won prizes, <laughs> which I think is a nice thing. But, um, so I, I would be, I was, um, in this show, uh, it was it was a show, and I remember being up there with my ukulele and playing. Um, it might have been a song called uh, "Playmate." Come out and play with me, and bring your dollies three. Climb up my apple tree, slide down my ring barrel, slide down my cellar door. We'll be jolly friends forevermore. Oh, she couldn't come out and play. It was a bright and sunny day. With a cheerful eye, she breathed a sigh. And I could hear her say, Every playmate, I cannot play with you. My dolly has the flu. Hoo, 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 hoo. <laughs> Ain't got no rain barrel. Ain't got no cellar door. But we'll be jolly friends. This is the jolly move. I was taught this. <laughs> this means jolly. <laughs> jolly friends forever more. Anyway, I was playing my ukulele and my string went out of tune. Seriously out of tune. And I stopped in the middle of my performance and I looked at my mother. I walked off the stage and I handed her the ukulele to fix because I didn't know how to tune the guitar, the ukulele yet. And she was mortified you know, that, I, that I had stopped. And the whole audience was like laughing and they thought this was just great fun, you know, that I was doing this. And I went back and I finished the song. <laughs> and my, my mom told this story a lot, you know, then. Do you believe that? She did. She gave me the guitar. I didn't know what to do. I moved the ukulele pattern. Hey, that's nice. That's nice. That's real good. Hey, what's the name of that song? Baby oh, guitar. That's quite a baby. <laughs> got a rose between its toes, too, don't you? Yeah, thank you. With a tear in every room Well, I want to love you, promise Let me the halo moon But you think I should be happy With my money and my name And hide yourself in sorrow While I play the cheating game Silver threads and golden needles Cannot mend this heart of mine But you think I should be happy with my money and my name And hide yourself in sorrow while I play the cheating game Yeah.
your teens, did you rebel? It seemed the thing to do um, back in those days. I don't know what I was doing. I was, I was, um, yeah, something, uh, I was in, uh, my parents had moved to a very provincial area in uh, New Jersey. Very, very, um, uh, everybody seemed to belong to something. And when I moved there, I instantly felt like an outsider. So, uh, and I was just starting junior high school and everybody knew everybody and they had all gone to school together and I really was the new kid. And uh, my re reaction to that was uh, kind of a, a stubborn quietness. You know, I didn't, I didn't do anything bad, I just, I just felt like, you know, because I didn't belong, I felt uh, not equal somehow. You know, so um, that's where it started. <laughs> then it got worse. <laughs> were you? How would you describe yourself as a teenager? Then were were you happy? Were you sad? Were you all the things that teenagers tend to go through? Yeah, I think I was all those things. But again, because I was a, a loner and didn't have a lot of friends. Um, I don't, in fact, at one point, I don't think I had any friends. I just went from uh, uh, being, um, you know, odd. People called me an oddball, you know. And... Uh, and then I just had boyfriends, you know, and... Uh, Were you writing so I, at this stage at all? Were you... Oh, singing? I wrote my whole life. Really? I wrote, I wrote torch songs when I was four years old, you know, uh, because those are the songs that I was exposed to. I was exposed to a lot of different music, um, folk songs from my union organizing labor songs songs of labor and um and then blues and jazz and uh billy holiday music and uh bessie smith and my mom's idols you know and uh she uh, peggy lee i always loved peggy lee so a wide and variety one of the a first, wide variety uh, of inspirations really all over and um there was, it was, um, I remember my, one of my first records, it was a, a red, red record, you know, they had these little, little records for kids. And the, the, one of the first songs that I remember hearing on a record, like my own little record player was, um, the Teddy Bears Picnic. Hmm. Do you know that song? I do. It's a great song. You go down to the woods today, you better not go alone. It's lovely down in the woods today, but safer to stay at home. For every bear that ever there was will gather there for certain because today is the day the teddy bears have their picnic. And I loved that record, and I wore it out. I loved th that was like my music, you know. It's very uh, visual, but, isn't it? A very visual song i mean you see oh, you can so see it good. yeah <laughs> lots of wonderful things to eat wonderful games to play beneath the trees where nobody sees they'll hide and seek as long as they please for that's the way the teddy bears have their picnic <laughs> And then it goes off into this other thing. Picnic time for teddy bears. The little teddy bears are having a wonderful time today. Watch them catch them unawares to see their picnic. I'm trying to remember the words. I can't believe I can. <laughs> uh, on their holiday, see them gaily gout about. They're simply mad about. <laughs> they never have any cares. At six o'clock, 
their mommies and daddies will take them home to bed because they're tired little teddy bears. <laughs> it's a funny song. I love that song. I should very, be very beautiful. I really I need to that. make a children's album. Yeah. In your teen years, did you have any ambitions outside of a musical career? Uh, I never had an, any vision of a musical career. <laughs> my mother had always uh, been singing and people in my household sang and played instruments. My father played a saxophone. This was hobbies and pastimes and never, I mean, I would look at like famous singers and uh, especially my gender, you know, and I was, well, I'm not going to be one of those, you know, <laughs> they're all glammed up and with big red lips and, and, uh, you know, plunging necklines. And I, I never saw myself as that, you know, so what I was, I was Davy Crockett when I was little. Oh, well, so was I. Yeah, how about you? Are you really? I, I had the coonskin hat cap, yeah. Coonskin um, hat. And so I here in Liverpool, I was running around as Davy. He had massive <laughs> impact. That is funny. <laughs> <laughs> Davy Crockett of Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> in shorts. <laughs> so, I'm guessing 1964, February, the Ed Sullivan Show. Were you there? Did you watch that? show when four Liverpudlians appeared. I know, that was an amazing thing because there weren't that many shows that would allow a person uh, in the genre of songs that I sang. They, they didn't really put many pop people on mm. major television shows. So it was like considered an amazing event that Ed Sullivan, and Ed Sullivan was so gracious when I I was at a pretty peak of career and the the audience who came to the um, audience, the live audience that he had, a lot of them were my fans and it had become some sort of a thing to do to jump up on my stage and, and just sit around and like candles and whatever people did sing along with me and um you know call out songs that they wanted to hear and so this is what happened at the rehearsal of the ed sullivan show and the stage manager who i think was actually ed sullivan's brother but um came out trying to get these people off the stage and and ed sullivan came out and said no these youths are very respectful <laughs> and I'm going to let them stay here. And everybody's like looking like Ed Sullivan's gone mad. <laughs> you know, He's letting this happen. So, uh, but it was very nice for me because it was much more like a concert. And I was very stiff on television. Television was, I, I was, you know, it, it was, it was very, uh, I, I couldn't think of myself being on television. You know, it, it was overwhelming. So to be able to have the audience do what they normally did in the show was a great comfort. And Ed Sullivan um, was really, really interesting. He really was. He said something like, not since, I think he said Elvis, not since Elvis Presley or the Beatles or something <laughs> that um, he hadn't seen this kind of reaction from the fans. So what had led you to that moment? Because you said a few minutes ago that uh, you didn't see yourself uh, following in the footsteps of the singers. No, no, not at all. It's what, strange. What was because... your mental turning point that allowed you to pick up a guitar, to actually stand in front of people and do this? Well, I did go to Greenwich Village a lot with my mom. And she sang, you know, with Sam the Man Taylor. And she was, she loved the avant-garde, uh, Sun Ra, and um, 
she she sang in the village in jazz places and I would go to the village with my guitar and I would sing in the street and I you know I I think I was such a, a shy person but for some reason when I sang I could I could be free of those inhibitions isn't that the weirdest thing because in life, I have a hard time walking from one end of a party to another. You know, I would, I would just be one of those people who head for the corner and stay there. But um, somehow, you know, I was in Greenwich Village. I put the guitar on, and of course, I, I didn't have a guitar case. Guitar cases were only for people who went, like, to Berkeley or something, you know, or uh, Juilliard. They they were those kind of guitar players, but I I was the the three chord type guitar player, and I just have it hanging on my neck. It was um, you know just hanging on my back, and I would just go into Washington Square and start singing. And because I had a really loud voice, I attracted a big crowd of people, and that in itself would surprise me almost you know I, I was in my own little world I'm singing a few people would come and then all of a sudden I'd look up and there's maybe a hundred people around me and what you were supposed to do is you know have a hat <laughs> and collect money I didn't I didn't ha put those things together yet <laughs> so um, I didn't have a hat or a guitar case so I just walk away real fast and go to another spot. to live in Wish I could find a good book Well, if I could find a real good book I'd never have to come out and look at what they've done to my song Ils ont changé ma chanson But maybe it'll all be all right, Ma. Maybe it'll all be okay. Well, if the people are buying tears, I'll be rich someday, Ma. Look what they done.
Tied it up in a plastic bag and they turned it upside down, my love. What they done? Well, they can't even clap along. Boy, look at what they done to my song. You get a record deal at some point. Um, yeah, how, well, how, this was, you know, this was truly um, a matter of meeting Peter, my husband, manager, producer, who the first time he met me, he just, I just knew he saw something that I had never seen. And, or maybe I did, but just didn't allow that vision. And um, my, nobody ever, you know, said, wow, you're gonna be a star or something, you know. <laughs> um, that was the furthest thing from, from my thoughts. And I walked into that um, office the day of meeting Peter, and I had been on my way to an acting audition. I, uh, as a path of least resistance, my father would not let me end schooling at high school. He wanted me to go to college. And the thought of another, you know, classroom with people that I felt odd and not belonging, I just didn't want to do it. And, that, and I ran away from home because of that, because I... I did not see myself um, in that sort of a, a situation. Going to four years of college was not what I wanted to do. <laughs> I think my father had visions of me being your taunt. <laughs> he was, he was going to, all his friends, uh, you know, they were having coming out parties and things. And, you know, the girls were, and he, I think he wanted, he had that vision for me. Um, you know, he, he definitely had the wrong girl, <laughs> but, but um, he, um, he was very supportive and he wanted to know well, what kind of, after I ran away from home and I ran away all the way from New Jersey to California. I didn't just, you know, take a little day trip. <laughs> I, did, I, I did the real runaway. I was in California and ended up in a girl's detention home because they had word, well, it was before, you know, instant communication and knowing what was going on. They knew they were looking for a girl from New Jersey who, who ran away from home. And there weren't that many runaways then, you know? It was, uh, it was not the thing to do. I sort of started a trend. But um, so I, you know, was picked up by police and brought to a girl's detention home. Um, I had an amazing bunch of experiences in California. I met um, Ridgely, who was a big star in the Gallant Men, and I met him on the plane going out to California. And he, I had made up a name. My name was Eve Dane. That's my name. That was my name. And he said, what's your name? I said, Eve Dane. And, oh, and you're going to California. What are you going to be doing there? I said, oh, you know, you know I'm something pretty lame, I think. And um, by, by the time we were, he had, I didn't have a, um, an instrument with me because I thought that would be too much of a giveaway, you know, that if they were looking for a girl, so I, I didn't make, but he had a guitar above uh, his seat and he took, we started talking about music and he played guitar and he took his guitar out and we started singing and um, in the plane. And when I got to um, LA, he said, so you, you're, you're okay, right? Like you're, 
you know where you're going. You're not just, you have a place to stay. Oh, yes, I have a place to stay. And I'm thinking, where am I going to stay? <laughs> you know? um, and he said, because I know, um, you know, some, a lot of people in, uh, what do you do? And I, I told him I was an actress. You know, I was going to L.A. to be an actress. So um, so I said goodbye to Robert Ridgely. I didn't know if he was a famous person, by the way. I just thought he was a nice man. And uh, he uh, said goodbye. I said goodbye. Now I'm at a phone booth in the airport calling somebody who gave me a name, a number of somebody who might know somebody who I could stay with when I'm in LA. Now I'm realizing, what did I do? You know, I, not even considering that my parents would be hysterical. <laughs> you know, you don't think that. This is like, this is what you, you think you should do and you do it. And, um, so I, I was in the airport on a telephone and Robert Ridgely passed. His chauffeur was carrying his bags and he looked over and said, Eve, <laughs> I know the woman who runs the Hollywood studio club for girls. And I, if, you're a, a, if you know a working actor, I can get you in there. So I went, that would be really good. <laughs> so I went off in his limo and, and he, he took me in and I was introduced and this is Eve Dane and she's an actress and uh, you know, this could, but he, he asked me how old I was. And I think I was, you know, 16 or 17. <laughs> and I said, I'm 21, you know, of course. And I, he knew. You know, he knew that I, I'm making this whole thing up. And he, he absolutely helped me get stay out of trouble because that would have been a pretty wild thing if I, I didn't have anywhere to stay. I didn't know anyone. And here's Robert Ridgely from The Gallant Men. He brings me to the Hollywood Studio Club for Girls. And I get a little room, you know, and it was... It was uh, it was very pleasant until I had another experience because I'm, I was a little kid, really. I didn't know what I was doing. And I stopped and talked to strangers. <laughs> um, I talked to the wrong stranger and I ended up in trouble because I was in a situation where I could have gotten hurt. And I ran out the door and um, I excused myself from this room with a couple of guys in there, those pesky boys. <laughs> and, um, I, I started running. I just started running. The police picked me up and they brought me um, to a corner. And I, from there, I got a, uh, to the Hollywood Studio Club for Girls. And I walk in, it's after hours now, you know, and uh, I was let in, I was let in and uh, uh, I went to my room and I sat there like shaking. I, I, you know, I had probably just escaped with my life, you know, and uh, I got a, there was one of those phones in the room attached to the wall and it rang and I picked up and the woman there who was in charge said, Melanie, I went, uh-huh. And then I realized, what did I just do? <laughs> Who is that? Who knows my name? <laughs> and they said, there's someone here to see you. And I thought, maybe it was my mother or father or something. And I went downstairs, it was the police. <laughs> but they had this notice that they were looking for a girl from New Jersey. and. It was me. So they put me in a girl's detention home. Wow. This is <laughs> I didn't write any songs there. <laughs> I, I think the time, Way has, too scared. <laughs> the time has come to write those songs. This is a musical that you're describing. Uh, I, I mean, what a story. This is amazing. <laughs> so back yeah, it's quite a story. And then I walk into the wrong office. I meet Peter, who is 
the P.T. Barnum of the music industry. <laughs> I mean, he was so outgoing, such an extrovert. And, and he saw something in me that, you know, he, he was determined, you know, to have people hear me. Because at first, you know, my voice was very gravelly and um, very different. You know, I wasn't in the beautiful, or, you know, none of that. There was none of that. So a lot of people say, oh, she sounds like she's singing underwater, you know, and um, things like that. And uh, sometimes they would, people in the studio might say, can't you control your vibrato? And I didn't even know what that was. How, how <laughs> so, much freedom, how much freedom were you given in the studio? I mean, um, total, total, right. Well, Peter, Peter gave me complete, he, he would, he would like hang on every syllable, every, every nuance, you know, that, um, and sometimes, you know, he would go against, uh, what the, you know, the guys, the studio guys might think or say or some, and he said, no, no, she has her own thing. So um what it was and i had my first uh record that was like a turntable hit it wasn't actually a hit record but it was being played on a lot of radio stations was beautiful people mm. and that was the um the song that you know nobody thought could possibly happen and um it was uh you know what they called a turntable hit. Now they couldn't have such a thing because radio is so controlled. You know, they, they, you know a DJ doesn't decide a song and plays it, you know. You, you, went, you went global pretty quickly, really, didn't you? You went global. Suddenly you were not just New York, you were around the world. I mean, I know here Absolutely. in the UK suddenly well, hearing that voice for the first time I know. <laughs> you know it was yeah. it was truly astonishing um i mean it was amazing times and you know incredible times because so much was happening but boy did you stand out i know it was um peter always said that i was much more european hmm. he said my appeal would be much more european he thought so that was the you know for Actually, my first record that was ever uh, a hit was in France. It was a song called Bobo's Party. And a really strange song, actually. And, um, but that was a hit. And uh, I got to France and <laughs> there were, you know, people with, Melanie, we love you. <laughs> I had no idea, you know. This. Had you traveled before? I mean, had you traveled through your childhood or had you been out um, of the U.S.? No, I hadn't. I had, the only time I left the country, uh, my parents would, you know, go on summer vacations. Like the farthest we went was to Canada. <laughs> and that was, that was the biggest thing, you know, to leave the country and go to Canada. What are your but, memories of coming to England then, of coming to Britain? Do you have any particular memories of the U.K.? Oh yeah, it was it was the sixties. But to my my perception of the style uh, in England was that it was it was embraced as a look much more than what the ideal was. It felt much more like. I mean, the, the style was so much more high style, hip, hippie 60s-ness than, I, well, I didn't like hang out and hate Ashbury or anything, you know, so I didn't, I don't know from that, but certainly in Greenwich Village, it was, you know, anything goes, you know, people wore torn jeans or uh, you know, embroidered things and um, headbands or not headbands. But when I got to England, it was like Hollywood central casting for hippies. You know, it was beautiful. I I had seen 
clothes that were so astonishing. And in fact, that is uh, where I really, uh, my look kind of originated because um, uh, before then I was, I knew I loved embroidery. I loved embroidery and the, the PR lady at one point in New York said, we have to, you know, you have to have a look. And I thought, well, I don't know what that is. You know, that's, I'm, I like embroidery and I wear, you know, my hair down and this is what I look like. And she said, but what do you fantasize yourself? as looking you know how do you fantasize what do you what would you if you could have any kind of clothing and any kind of style you wanted what would that be and um there was an artist called uh Sulamith wolfing and she painted um layers of clothes and lots of celtic uh symbols and to me I wanted to be right out of one of those paintings if I could dress like any. And when I went to England, I saw a lot of people dressing like that. <laughs> and they they almost loved Solomon Wolfie. <laughs> and, um, but there were beautiful things. I think just, you know, fabrics and colors and uh, people really got into the look of, that the 60s look was beautiful. And um, I was in Chelsea, we, were, we, were, we had a flat and we were living there. And I went down the street one day and I went into this little shop and they had, um, uh, that's where I found the first Babe Rainbow poster, by the way. It was um, uh, the artist who painted it had his, um, painting done on a tin, a uh, piece of tin. And that fascinated me, Babe Rainbow. Of course, I wrote a song called Babe Rainbow. <laughs> and, um, but she had these dresses that were called um, Bedouin wedding dresses. And I, I put one on and I thought, oh, this is what that woman, the PR woman meant when she said, if you could wear anything, what would it be? And it was this Bedouin wedding dress. And I, I think, and they were really inexpensive. They had lots of embroidery. And what the story is, is um, a woman would uh, wear this at her wedding and then she would hand it down to her daughter and more embroidery would get done with each marriage. So the, the tapestry of these, dresses it was like I had met my match you know and I bought a bunch of them and it was great because you could go on the road and and they, it was made of this black fabric mostly of a of a kind that didn't wrinkle so I um I bought a bunch of these dresses and I could pack five or ten of them in a suitcase and go on the road for a year they were great, they were very practical, <laughs> as well as being very ornately embroidered. I love, I love uh, fabrics.
don't you and you paint on I stones. do I paint I do all kinds of odd things on stones I have some here now some are I um this one is you know I just saw the face in the stone that's wow. you know sort of a, so where is that stone from um you know what I don't know hmm. I found it on my bureau <laughs> and it had fallen on the floor and I, I said where did the stone come from and but it it was it looked like a heart hmm. but then I was looking at it and I it's sort of like seeing faces in the clouds you know I, I look at a stone and some of them just have something like um let me see like this one is just he he just he looks like you know uh, can you see it? I yeah. can. That's beautiful. It, look, now, it looks like a. It, that was face was in there. Most you know, I didn't make this up. You know, most artists that I know use canvas. What what attracted yeah. you to stone? <laughs> it probably would be a little more profitable had have I <laughs> if I were able to use canvas. This is called when stone face smiles. Excellent. That's, that's and but uh, but then the, there are others. There's like this one. Oh, this one is a babu lady, and um, I call her Oi Bojami. There. And, how, and long, then, how long have you been doing this? But um, I've, I've been painting on stones since I was a kid. Mm. I always painted on stones, but now these are a little more intricate. Um, mm. You see it? Yep. And then I do the backs of them too. But I, a, a friend of mine uh, embedded, you know, wrapped this one 
So it was They're beautiful. Are these, are these available for people to uh, purchase? Not, not really. I mean, hmm. sometimes I'll paint, you know, some, these are my sweet home, Alabama. <laughs> hmm. Very I nice. have a series of owls. <laughs> I can see an owl over your shoulder as we speak. What? There is an owl over your shoulder as we speak. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. My owl a uh, stein. I collect steins. Uh, beautiful. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. But the but the, these are the ones that I really are I call them ladies honor or saints. <laughs> That was, but yeah, no, I haven't like connected with a well, gallery or anything. Okay. Well, oh, she's she's really cute. I think she's Dutch. <laughs> definitely Dutch, definitely. Um, right. Well, this leads into my next question, really, because and it's a question I've asked many people over the years, and I'm always hopeful somebody will give me an answer. And my question is: Tell me, Melanie, what is the meaning of life? Oh, that. <laughs> well, that changes weekly, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, I, I, there, are, I, it's a crazy life. It's to, you know, enjoy whatever moments you have and to be as helpful to people. My feeling is the meaning of life is to be of service mm. to humanity in some way to give to humanity some reason to continue because there isn't one, you know? So this is my, this is what I believe is the meaning is to give a reason. That is my favorite reason so far in this series. Aw, thank you. Um, and and I just made that up, really. Well, that's I did. all the best. I'm amazed to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down quickly. <laughs> yes. Look at that one. Thank you. And these are fantastic. These are truly fantastic. Oh, um, thank you. America, America today. You're sitting there in America. I'm sitting in Liverpool. Um, yeah. What do you make of it? You know, to me, America was the last holdout. I know it's going to be an unpopular view, especially in Europe and England. Um, but Europe and England got tame a lot sooner than America. And, and, and they're, they're taming people and behave well. And there is a lot to say about behaving because you know it makes life easier for lots of other people but i'm not a great believer in well behaved i'm a believer in good manners but not tame so and and again i mean the the freedoms in this country have been diminished. In the name of all kinds of things. And again, everything's being politicized and all I see is a, a dwindling effect on the arts and humor. There's a movie called um, Ridicule. It's a French film. If you if you get a chance, watch that film. I'm right. Ridicule. Ridicule. And and uh, to me, it says a lot about people you're afraid to speak out against are the people who control you. That's it. So, I I'm not a political person. People don't come to see my music because they're going to get enlightened about who to vote for. I don't talk about it. This is my opinion. That's why there are secret ball ballots. <laughs> Go in and do what you want, you know. But um, I, I see a, a dwindling uh, action of our rights. Mm. I used to come home from Europe and think, oh, 
it's so great here. I could just say anything. I could do, you know, and I could be loud and noisy. I'm not that I am, but I can <laughs> if I want. I want to be. If I want to be, I can. And I, I remember when I first took my children to Europe, especially Germany, and uh, I would take them into restaurants because we were on the road, you know. So they, and you know, kids will be kids, and they'll may make noise and do. I would get these looks, and I think, God, I can't wait to get home, you know, <laughs> for that. But but it's almost the same here. Mm. People give you dirty looks. <laughs> Speaking of uh, children, would the 10-year-old Melanie get on with the Melanie of 2020? I was always fascinated with people who had things to say. You know, so I would talk, I talked to everybody. I talked to old people and and young people. And I'm not sure if I'd, have become so meddled with that I would think I'm irrelevant. But um, uh, then I was very interested. So I, I think so. I mean, I'm thinking if I was a kid now or well, then. You're asking then, I'm right? I'm asking, yeah, the 10 year old you, you as you were. Uh, if what? Right. She walked into that room today with you. Would you think you would get on, and vice versa? Would you get on with that ten-year-old kid? If if the the woman let me play with the rocks, yes, <laughs> <laughs> and touch them. If I were allowed to touch them, and would the woman let her? Joni Mitchell. <laughs> oh wow! Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> Um, well, that brings us to the future. <laughs> it's future! Up, it's speeding towards us. Um, you, you're somebody who seemed to be on tour a lot through your life. Um, yeah, I, and this is quite a halt. Yeah. You know, this is, it's horrible. It it's is. It's horrible. <laughs> I, I agree completely. So what are we going to do? And what are you going to do, more importantly? I'm going, to, I'm going to proceed as much as possible to be as much of who I am and how I do things as possible. And I'm, I'm sure there'll be people who are going to get angry with me for maybe not singing with my face mask on or something. <laughs> I mean, I can't even imagine. I can't, I can't wear them. I just, I can't breathe right with a face mask. On. And also I found out all this stuff about, well, they don't work. You know, and it's it's not airborne, and it's not even a matter of stuff being on surfaces. Seventy percent of the people get COVID. I hate that word. It sounds like Darth Vader. Doesn't COVID sound deep, dark? Darth Vader, COVID. I mean, they they purposely gave it a more evil name. I know they did to terrify people. So, um, but but people are getting it but the effects aren't as um, killer as they were. Mm. So I, I'm here to say I wouldn't be so afraid, but that's probably politically aligns me with something very unpopular, so I don't say that. Just do what you, you, know, you feel like you wanna do, but if you're really afraid, it means something's wrong, because you don't need to be so afraid. Are you writing? Uh, so I'm 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 going to tour as soon as anybody lets me, okay. um, and with whatever we have to do, I'm going to do a live stream show. Be on the lookout. I am going to do this. We got um, Bo Jared, my son, has gotten all into um, vi visual. He's also a, a, an engineer, you know, for audio, but. Um, uh, we're going to be doing a live stream show where we sell tickets. You know, I have to, we're we're working on that. I, you know, again, I didn't us. have an agent. All um, the details will be coming up on your website, I'm sure. So I know. hope so. Yeah, <laughs> if I get that together, I hope so. And um, but yeah, that's what I'm I'm doing right this minute. Are you writing? Uh, are you writing? Um, I mean, I write. I I just wrote a song with Keb Mo. 
and um, and, and that's a, it, was, it was a great collaboration. I he came over here. We worked on a song. We finished it. I'm going upstairs right after this, and I'm going to do my vocal on it. Is your is your writing process any different? To uh, has it changed, evolved uh, through the years, or writing a song is you know my my the best way. I think the best way. Um, my best songs are ones that just come flying out. You know, and I know um, I've had experiences where I was. Uh, one, I had this one time that I was writing for a Hollywood TV show and uh, they uh, they wanted this for a, a particular piece of music that was the theme. And Beauty and the Beast? I, Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Hmm. And I, um, I got the, the music and the minute I got it, I had the lyrics. The lyrics were done. They were in my head. As soon as I was hearing the music, the lyrics were like in there. Just like, you know, I look at a stone and I see a little wolfy thing. I saw the lyrics and I, I heard the lyrics in my head. And I wrote um, the song like instantly. I handed it in the next day and the director said, oh, well, I'll have to run this by the producer and the producer will have to run it by the actor and the actor will have to run it by, and everybody's like looking at who's the important person who's going to accept it or veto it. And uh, they, so they, they looked and they said, oh no, no, uh, the director, the, the producer thinks it needs more of his point of view in the lyric. I thought, well, that's really silly. <laughs> What does that mean, you know? So I, you know, wrote some more. And um, now I hand that back. No, no, it's it's got his point of view, but it's not open enough. And she needs to be expressed. And this is what needs to happen. And so I'm writing. I had a whole legal pad filled with lyrics. And they were getting more and more ridiculous and more contrived. And... And then at one point they wanted me to say beauty and the beast. And I couldn't do that. You know, I just couldn't do that. And, and I kept writing and writing. Now this was right before people had the ability to have instant computer access to everything. It was all yellow legal paths. But give me my, my, um, the Emmy. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So, um, I'll make a point with this, <laughs> with this, the, um, they were, uh, you know, back and forth and torturing me. They were torturing me. It was torture. I decided because I knew, I knew the very first <laughs> lyric was perfect. So what I did was I handed them the first lyric I ever did and crossed my fingers that nobody would remember. <laughs> and sure enough, I got a call the next day and the producer said, Melanie, you got it. You see, honey, all that hard work paid off. And I, I won an Emmy for this. Well, <laughs> well done you. And you <laughs> realize the reason they went through that process was because they had to be seen to be doing something. They uh, had to be seen to be doing something and they didn't kind of like people. that it was so quick. <laughs> I said, if I ever did story. anything for Hollywood again, I would make it a couple of weeks before I hand anything in. <laughs> they want to think you suffered over it. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a beautiful story. Uh, it's a horrific story, but it's a beautiful story as well. <laughs> Because I it's know really, it's in true. Arts, it's totally anybody true. in the arts it will resonate with who's gone through <laughs> similar things. Uh, Melanie, it's been a delight to uh, see and uh, chat with you uh, tonight, and uh, thank you so much not only for tonight but um, for the last fifty plus years. Um, yeah. You have made such a difference to this planet. You truly have made it 
a place worth visiting. And uh, of my heart, I want to thank you for that. There have been many Lovely. moments where you have made the difference to me uh, personally. And I, I'm sure I'm speaking for a zillion people out there. So Aww, keep on. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you so much. Yep. Well, say hello to Jane, <laughs> and I hope to see you in real life quick. <laughs> I, we better had. I'm, I'm looking forward yeah. to that moment. Cheers, Melanie. There's a chance peace will come in your life, least by one. There's a chance peace will come in your life. Sometimes when I'm feeling as big as the land With the velvet hill and the small of my back And my hands are playing the sand And my feet are swimming in all of the waters All of the rivers are givers To the ocean according to plan According to man Well sometimes When I'm feeling as big as the land And I become the world And the world becomes a man And my song becomes a part Peace will come in your life. Please buy one. There's a chance. Peace will come in your life. Please buy one.
please buy one.